I'm, I'm Evan Van Ness. Uh, so I'm talking today about year in Ethereum. This was gonna. I was gonna say I couldn't hear myself, so that makes sense. There we go. Yes. So I'm Evan Van Ness. I'm talking about the year in Ethereum. So it was supposed to be a panel of me and Josh Stark, and we write this uh, post every year. But uh, he is on his way to the airport, so it's just me. So me. I put a lot of work into these slides. Uh, I have an MBA, but somehow my PowerPoint skills never, never quite got there. Uh, so I am. Uh, I, I do a, a newsletter. I founded a newsletter and published a newsletter called Week in Ethereum News. That's weekinetheriumnews.com. Uh, I have a little venture fund where we invest in the future of Web3 called Starbloom Ventures, and uh, do some other stuff as well. Um, so every year, you know, we, we publish this year in Ethereum. I think it actually got started at another hackathon, ETH Singapore, back in 2018 in Denver where the price of ETH had just hit $80, and Josh and I were sitting there, and we, we had this you know, weird feeling where we were at a hackathon, we were feeling the energy like this one. It, it was obviously much smaller. Uh, you know, we were a little jet lagged, but there was this weird like, you know, feeling of you know, uh, the, the popular crypto sentiment was that you know, like, Ethereum was sort of stagnant, and like, we felt the opposite. You know, as someone that like, publishes a newsletter on this every week, Am I too loud? No, I'm not loud enough? Oh, I felt like I was hearing feedback and it was making me nervous. Okay. Uh, so I felt like, uh, we, we felt like we, we were really feeling the energy and like the popular sentiment was, was, was different. And so we decided to write a blog post uh, about you know, like how we felt the, the year in Ethereum had gone. And so we have done it every year since. It is usually a 25 to 30 minute read or something like that. We feel like we could put a lot more in, and in fact, we probably cut uh, two-thirds of the words that we write and two-thirds of the topics that we, we put in, uh, and it still ends up being a massive, massive uh, you know, post every year. Really, like Ethereum is, is growing to the point where you know, it's, it's hard to just encapsulate it in one post, or even for me, like in, in one newsletter. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's crazy to see the growth. So, this basically is going to be a, a graphical view of the year in Ethereum is what we're going to take a little tour of. So the, we're going to start with you know, total transaction fees. So you can, only, you can fast forward or rewind uh, a couple years ago where Bitcoiners were saying you know, like Bitcoin would always be the, you know, the number one in, in blockchain fees. And then last year, it, I believe it was last year, it, it Bitcoin fl uh, ETH flipped Bitcoin in transaction fees. And uh, since then, it's like not even a competition. Uh, and you know, um, Bitcoin in particular depends on its its transaction fees for for security long term, and uh, you know it's it's not going too well for them, uh, as you can see on screen. Um, sort of amusingly, is you know Binance Smart Chain is just a fork of of Ethereum clients, and uh, it's actually almost about to catch uh, you know Bitcoin for total transaction fees uh, for the year, and then everything else really doesn't register. Uh, so. Sort of an interesting slide. In some ways, I think if I was going to do one image, I could just do it right here. Um, I'm getting told I need to lean in, so uh, yeah. Apologize for that if I'm not volume voluble enough. Uh, you know, transaction fees is not necessarily the absolute best measurement. You know, but if it, if you have to pick one, I would say it's still the one to pick uh, at the moment. Um, so. That was just base chains, just la layer ones. Uh, if you include, you know, all of the apps, uh, then it actually becomes Ethereum's dominance is even more clear. So all the things in pink here are Ethereum applications. So Uniswap, you know, SushiSwap, Aave, Compound, um, and and it's you know it's really crazy. And like I said, Binance even is really just a, a centralized fork of Ethereum clients. So. Total fees and revenues, you know, I think one of the themes from this year uh, for year in Ethereum was that uh, Ethereum has sort of grown past the point where Bitcoin was really a competitor in terms of usage. You know, really like we're starting to get to the point where Visa is really the competitor in the, in the payment rail. You know, as you can see on the slide, like you know, Ethereum passed Stripe uh, and, you know, in, in revenues, uh, Visa is, is in the crosshairs. And if we grow like we've been growing in the past years, then you know we're probably going to flip it in 2022. 
And in fact, if you look at total transaction volume, Ethereum has already flipped Visa. Uh, you know, there's some you know things you could say about that, but I think like as a general like uh, d directional thing, it's it, it's pretty clear that like now Ethereum is a legit worldwide international payment rail that crosses borders in a better way than banking system does, it, which is you know. Uh, you know, if you ever have to send an international bank wire, it is a pain in the butt. You know, it takes hours. It you know, it takes days for them to confirm that it went through. They you know, you have to sign a lot of paperwork. Not with Ethereum. So another good metric is total value locked. Invented by Scott Lewis from DeFi Pulse, who I was just talking to uh, the other a little bit ago. Amusingly, one, one fun thing about Scott is that I remember somebody was uh, mansplaining uh, TVL to him on Twitter a few, uh, maybe a year ago, and he said, like, you know, I'm the one that invented TVL. Um, sort of amusing, amusing moment. Um, but as, as you can see here, you know, like, uh, Ethereum has, uh, DeFi has more TVL than Bridgewater, you know, one of the biggest head funds, and more than Robinhood. Uh, and so one of the big themes of 2021 was the rise of Layer 2. I think it is under, uh, underappreciated that the idea of Ethereum is that it's supposed to be a global sediment layer. So users really in the long run should not be using Layer 1. They should be using Layer 2. And so the idea is that a like transaction fees on an individual user layer are, should be kept low, but transaction fees on a L1 should be high. Um, and uh, so we've, we've seen the, like, the amount of, uh, of ETH and, and, and stable coins and, and whatnot that have trans, uh, migrated to layer two. Uh, this is actually from layer two beat, which I believe is l2beat.com. Uh, and uh, you know it's it's sort of impressive. This is actually uh, I took this this morning, this screenshot, so it's not not perfect, but uh, whatever. Uh, so as I said, like the idea for Ethereum is supposed to be that you uh, have cheap fees on an individual transaction layer, and you can see this on on L2 fees uh, dot info, I believe it is, and. Um, it's already the case, right? Like, the future is here, but it's very unevenly distributed. Hey, hey, hey. The future is here, but it's unevenly distributed. All right. So nobody could hear me. That's great. Well, that, that feels great. Um, that sort of explains some of the faces I'm getting in the audience, for sure. Uh, so. Uh, L2 fees that info. I mean, you can see like the, the this was actually this morning, so not in 2021, but whatever. Uh, the you know the the, the the fees to transact are, are relatively cheap. Uh, of course, they're going to get a lot cheaper in the next couple years. Uh, optimistic rollups, in particular, continue to get better on compressing their data, and uh, call data as well is on the roadmap for you know one of the next hard forks after we turn off proof of work. Uh, so this is the uh, the other slide from L2 fees. Again, it was from this morning, but um, I, I think it's sort of an interesting like um, v view, which is pretty similar to you know la layer two transaction fees. But it's how much they are paying layer one to put their 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 data on Ethereum, and you know as you can see, like the, these things are starting to be um, a, you know a lot of money. Uh, that you know, that's just one day of the amount of ETH that, that was burned. Uh, you know, putting the the data from rollups on Ethereum, and again, like that's really like with a rollup centric roll -up roadmap, at least for the short and medium term. You know, block block space is really uh, Ethereum layer one block space is really for layer twos. So another you know obviously big thing was you know the rise of NFTs and the creator economy, and you know it, it it's really mind blowing. Uh, Josh did a lot of work, uh, as well as uh, some some of our assistants, putting together you know a bunch of like metrics and, and chasing down exactly like what how how Ethereum compared, and it, it's really kind of mind blowing. Uh, you know, you, you can compare it to Spotify, you can compare it to you know it, it passed some, some other things like Patreon here, um, and that leads to the next slide, which is uh, who makes a living on crypto, which. 
Um, I actually didn't really want to put this graph in the, uh, in the post, but Josh insisted, and as usual, he was right. So, uh, you know, it, it is pretty interesting to see, like, the evolution over the years, and, and you know, there's a lot of uh, truth, and you can see it at this hackathon, at this, I guess this is now more than a hackathon, where it's, it's certainly like the community has, has, has burgeoned and has really expanded quite a bit to different categories. So another big thing was um, things that happened at the protocol level, like EIP 1559. So this chart, the, the blue is the legacy transaction types. The green are the EIP 1559 types. Um, and you, you can see, like, you know, people are still doing um, legacy transaction types. And in general, they're overpaying by some ridiculous amount. Um, it, you know, it sort of depends on exactly how block space goes and, you know, um, but, but in general, like, if, if your wallet hasn't changed to EIP-1559, then you are overpaying for your transactions almost 100%. Um, and that's sort of what this next slide shows uh, somewhat, somewhat difficultly, but as you can see, the orange is what you're paying um, if you're using EIP-1559 and not uh, the blue is if you're not using the IP15 and 9. And so that's a little bit hard to see, right, the difference here. So the next slide is actually the difference. And you can see that basically you are always better off using EIP 1559. And I think really like one thing that got lost on Twitter is that EIP 1559 was always about having more predictable gas prices so that, you know, you could do a better job of getting into blocks I think a lot of people, particularly Eric Connor of Ethub, was really tired of explaining uh, gas prices to his friends, and he wanted something to be more sp particular and uh, specific uh, that, that would make it easier to, you know, just have people use it and it works. And you know, EIP fifteen fifty nine works. However, one interesting thing about the IP1559, which is of course not in any way uh, under-discussed, but it, it is a long-term value accrual mechanism for Ethereum uh, because the base fee of every transaction is burned. So I think there is one thing that is often lost here, which is that in proof of stake, it is really important that the native asset, ETH, be valuable and perhaps even increasingly valuable. Like that is one of the things that is, is really important. And uh, EIP 1559 sort of closes that loop and makes it a, a, an, an intrinsic value to, to the native asset. And as you can see here, like there are multiple days during 2021 that where the net issuance went below zero. And we've had weeks now in this current year in January where the entire issuance was, was negative um, over a seven-day rolling window. So one other thing, of course, is that, you know, we, we continue to have more people staking. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it just continues to go up. Um, people continue to stake, um, and you can see that here. So here is a roadmap, which was done by Trent Van Apps, which I think is, is really good. And um, you, know, you, you can see like what, what's going on here. Um, I think that's like, I was going to talk about this at the end, but I, I, apparently I put it in the slide here. Like what's going on this next year? You know, I think it's continually going to be that roll-offs are continually adopted. And uh, it, it's taken a long time to get apps to migrate to layer two to deploy their tokens on layer two, but it is increasingly happening. And of course, there are problems there, and developers need to change the way they think about some things. But uh, it, it, is, it, it is inevitable that in the long term, everything will be on layer two. The, the other thing that is, is happening this year, um, I would say with an extremely high um, confidence interval, is that we're going to turn off proof of work. Now, I don't know about you, but I am always, I've always been ready for Ethereum to turn off proof of work ever since before the chain launched. Um, I, I remember, yeah, exactly. Let's all clap for, for turning off proof of work. The, the energy waste is, is ridiculous. Um, there's, there's no intrinsic value to it. We can do it much better, much more securely with proof of stake. 
you know, in 2011 and 2012, I was reading these articles by this, uh, you know, 50-year-old Russian PhD uh, named Vitalik Buterin, and it was only until Ethereum came out that I realized that, you know, like he was no, he was like 17, living living in a basement in Toronto. Um, so, you know, I I, I think it's great. Um, current progress on that, of course, is that we're we're spinning up uh, test nets. Um, and uh, there's going to be one long-standing test net that will get spun up in the next week um, doing in the current uh, spec, which is intended to be the final dev net before we start forking all of the test nets uh, that are going to be kept around in, in proof of stake. I think that's really like a really underappreciated thing is that like we are getting like particularly close. And of course, it's, it's a complex software, and you know, we have billions at stake in the system, so you can't really you know, guarantee that it's going to happen on any time frame, but I feel quite confident that it's going to happen in the next few months. Um, as I said, like, we are getting to the point where we're forking test nets, and you never know, maybe we'll find something in test nets, but it's happening. You know, like Ron Paul, it, it's happening, dot gif. Uh, what, one one thing which you know I tweet about a lot is client diversity in, in staking, and um, you know that's a little bit outside of the scope of this talk, but you know I like to talk about it, so I'll talk about it a little bit here, which is that Ethereum is intended to be maximally decentralized, and when we have uh, across all axes, and um, for example, like you know Prism has a supermajority of uh, the, the validators. And that is, is not good. Um, for example, I would say that uh, you're taking a risk with your ETH if you're staking with a super majority client. And it's like a, one of the most important things for Ethereum to do better is to like sort of decentralize. We've seen this in the current mainnet where you know, Geth like, does an amazing job, but it's really unfair to them that like, they have a, a super majority and the network like, mostly runs on, on, on Geth. And it also means that they have to move, they have to be very careful about every modification that they make. You know, like more careful than if we had a bunch of clients that all had a third of the network. And they have to be careful about taking PRs from outside people. And that, that gets a lot of people upset. You know, people have PRs to geth all the time and they don't get merged. And, uh, you know, that's like unfortunately something that just like slows down the inherent nature of, 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 of the beast here, right, with, with software, the client software development. So, you know, run minority clients. It's important for Ethereum. If you can run them at home, that's even better. A lot of people think that you have to have great uptime. That is definitely not the case. You can be a very profitable validator uh, with, you know, with like uptime that anyone can do, like checking in here and there throughout the week to make sure your validator client is still running. Like maybe Linux crashed or whatever. Uh, maybe your, your client crashed. It's definitely a thing that y you don't really have to worry about. You can still be profitable even with bad internet in, some bad pla in, in a place with a bad internet connection, like the United States, perhaps. Uh, anyway, um, run minority clients. It's, it's, it's extremely important for you know, the long-term future of Ethereum. So one other really interesting thing is that um, DAOs have become, you know, it, it's been a long-term thing that we've talked about. You know, there was a 2013 blog post by Vitalik, maybe it was 2014, decentralized autonomous organizations. I don't know if like most DAOs these days are decentralized autonomous or organizations really, but uh, the idea that you can collaborate across, you know, like around the world with, a, with you know, share resources and vote, o vote on things and, and, and come up to different ways to reach consensus even at a group level, is, is really powerful. And we've started to see it here. I mean, you can even see the number of DAO voters on Snapchat. And uh, yeah, this is how we ended the, en ended the blog post, which is that, you know, like, this is, it, it was a bullish year for Ethereum. Like, a lot of things happened. We made a lot of, pro a lot of progress on turning off proof of work as a community. You know, L2s really started to come into their own, although they still need more adoption. And um, you know, look, the the future isn't isn't going to build itself. So you know, it's easy to get distracted, but let's not do that. And I think you know, seeing a lot of people here, feeling the energy at ETH Denver, people are still are still hyped and still want to build the future. I still want to make sure it is maximally decentralized. And so, that's it. I wanted to to thank by name all the people that uh, that that helped us with this. 
It is an insane undertaking, believe it or not. Josh and I spend hundreds of hours on it every year. We have a little bit of a panic attack every time it's New Year's Eve. Um, but, you know, we had assistants, uh, Br Bruno Lulinski, Miguel Ferreira, Nazim Rizvik, um, as, as well as some other people that like Superfiz, Lakshman Sankar, Liam Horn, Danny Ryan, Tim Bako, Don Craig Feist, Trent Van Epps, Bill White Hat, and Fabian from Slingshot. Um, uh, the post is out there. If you duck, duck, go, you're in Ethereum, you will find it, as well as all of the other years. And they're really actually, I mean, it takes a long time, but reading them all in chronological order is, is really interesting. And Josh has done a great job of, of sort of building on each one and sort of building some themes, which might not be evident if you just read the one post every year. So, uh, of course, all the data you can find there. So that is the end. Thank you for listening, especially if you couldn't hear me.